Thank you. I am very happy to be here to be speaking about your closest neighbor to the east. Um, although it's not uh, very much recognized in many different instances, I remember having gone to the northern part of New Zealand where the lighthouse uh, is there, and there is a pole with all the important geographical points. That they, it is Singapore, it is Vancouver, it is LA, it is London, of course, but there is nothing that connects to South America. And I thought, my goodness, what is this? So anyway, I am happy to be uh, able to, pre to represent a little bit Latin America here. I feel that in some ways we are in the process of closing a circle. Uh, because I'm going to be talking about Chile and all the problems that we have been discussing today actually started when neoliberalism was imposed in Chile under the dictatorial regime of Augusto Pinochet in 1973. September 11, by the way, 1973. So, and um, what is taking place today in Chile in the students movement is actually uh, an, imp an, an impressive, unprecedented, uh, is uh, an explosion of hopes, emotions, and, and projects that were unthinkable before May this year. Uh, the situation why this is unthinkable is because it's a nation run by fear. And that's why I started by saying that uh, with that sort of epigraph there, that they are afraid of us because we have no fear. That's exactly the spirit that is behind the students' movement in Chile. And since they are losing that fear of to dissent and actually to be out of the system, is that they have dared to uh, stop studying and actually dragging all the society uh, to their movement. I would like to say, though, that although you have mentioned, and I think you, Joel, mentioned Argentina, I think that the big movement that w is taking place today actually started in Argentina in December 2001, when the shock doctrine in Argentina absolutely demonstrated the atrocities of the neoliberal system. Um, the problem there is that it was in the periphery. So when all these things happen in the periphery, now, Periphery is usually all those nations outside of Europe or the English-speaking world. Uh, of course, Latin America being an incredible big continent, wealthy and, and with a lot of people, and speaking the third most spoken language in the world is still a periphery. So I, do, I really would like to acknowledge the fact that Argentina is the country in which all this movement began in December 2001. And, uh, and that's the memory that this movement in Chile is also recovering. When they said, for instance, all have to go. That was one of the most famous slogans in all the movement in Argentina. When they say all have to go, they meant politicians, bankers, all the elite that in some way had a say in the society. And that's, it. that's the slogan that the student movements have recuperated. Well, the beginning of all this is neoliberalism, and uh, the problem that the student movements started to target is very specific, and that's the novelty of the movement. It's very specific because this is a movement that started in high school in 2006, and it's what it was called the Revolt of the Penguins, referring to the uniform that high school students wear in, 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 in Chile, the Revolt of the Penguins. And what they were requesting is the end of the privatization of the public system in, the, in education. But it's a, it's a privatization that actually referred to the, the, the Ministry of Education not having any sort of power in the education, but that power being deferred to the municipalities, which meant that the municipalities are to finance the education, and those municipalities who have rich are going to provide a good education, or those who are poor are going to provide a very poor education. That movement was crushed, very little was achieved. This is, was under the presidency of, of uh, Michel Bachelet. But what thought was absolutely crushed and dead actually re-emerged uh, uh, last year when the, that generation who was in high school in 2006 was now studying at the university. And in the university, they elected two leaders. And these two leaders are basically uh, Camila Vallejo, the lady there, she became the president of the Students' Federation of the University of Chile, the most important university in the country. It's a public university. 
and this gentleman here in the bottom, which is Giorgio Jackson, who beca became the president of the Universidad Católica, which is a semi-private institution also in Chile, the most traditional. And the other gentleman here is Figueroa, who is the vice president. These are the leaders of the movement. The movement basically was presented as to reclaim the, 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 the education should be public, should be free, and should be of quality. Because 70% of the university education in Chile has been fully privatized. All right. So these students were requiring that. And the situation is that the most Im impressive element that these students created is that they tackle they tackle the very core of the social system in Chile or Latin America or in the world for that matter. The logic that they tried, the, the framework that they used in order to present these claims was the end of profit for profit sake. That is the slogan that they are going to present. Fin a lucro, lucro. Profit for profit's sake. With that maneuvering, with that logic, they immediately move the movement from being a student movement to become a social movement. And that's how the movement has, has grown and has been basically growing more and more. And they have been basically in a position to sit at a table with the president to discuss their agenda. Interestingly enough, in their agenda, they have all the five of the indigenous peoples in Chile, and they have all the ecological uh, causes that are being basically vented for the last year because there are plans for uh, a dam in the most pristine ecological areas in southern Chile, in the, Pata in the Chilean Patagonia, basically. All these began also because uh, there were protests around those issues. So the calls were for free education and a better quality of education. They extended this to the end of profit for profit's sake. And what, what this allowed is for the creation of a social movement. The interesting pr point of this is that this is, this is actually the essence of what is going to allow for the general public to understand that the problem in education was not a problem related to that alone, but to the whole society. And this is the moment in which you are going to see the precarity of the job, for instance, of the labor jobs. And here, when they start protesting about the, the, the education, you're going to see teachers, you're going to see fa parents, and you're going to see the in incredibly low quality of contracts for everybody, any professional working in education field. So what they are going to do then with this is that they are going to be able to crystallize all these fears, all the fears, all the, 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 the tiredness that existed of a country that has been absolutely uh, 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 destroyed by individualism, by isolation, by ostracism. What they are going to allow with this is that they are going in some ways put together all those fears, all that, that, that hopelessness that was existing and absolutely commanding and allowing for a top-down politics. What this is going to allow is to create basically the idea that is no representation. The main element of this is you don't represent me. That's going to be one of the most important also slogans. And the, the recuperation of a sense of a common sense. I will show you just some photographs here to, to, to say some of the strategies. I believe that the main strategies to brave with the fear that this student movement is going to be very, very successful are going to be in some ways trying to be absolutely political, incredibly political, but not looking at you cannot look political. And what do you do not to look political? You really have to avoid all the standard political jargon. You really have to avoid all the standard political discourses that are going to create an immediate reaction from the population. Because the extreme polarity that created the coup d'etat in Chile in 73, and that has not been erased in the last 20 years since democracy returned, is still there. So there is an, a deep sense of fear for anything political. So how do you manage to create a social movement that is absolutely tackling up very political points without looking political? And I believe that some of the, the strategies are going to be to create empathy. 
to basically appeal to a sense of a common issue, something that affects all of us, to create basically, to recuperate a common sense, what you were saying uh, about basically, we have a situation that is common to all of us, water is for all of us, et cetera, et cetera, horizontality in power, we are not represented. And the other element is to appeal again to a sense of community, that the reason we are being basically in this position is because we are being dismembered as a society. Um, and other element that they are gonna be, I think, absolutely fantastic in this movement is that they are going to appeal to history. For instance, in this time we say, uh, we don't want to be being the prey of the dictatorship. We don't want to be living in the shadow of the dictatorship because we are, cit we are cities, and the, the war is for the cities, it's not for the markets. Now, it's interesting how they are going to create this dialogue with the past. For instance, this is, a, this is how you say, this is an actor who is dressed as like Presidente Allende. And it's incredibly the effect that this produced in the streets when suddenly you have an impersonator of Presidente Allende and the people immediately saw this ghost who is actually absolutely there. So in some ways, by not saying again this person, by having the guy right there, you see in some ways an embodiment of dreams that are still alive. And in other uh, instances, they are going to create campaigns that are going to go for kisses and for to create this empathy, to go away from fear. How do you go away from fear and politics? This is the marathon of the kisses. And it's interesting what they say in, in the sign. If, if love is no noticeable, it's because they have destroyed it. Yeah. <laughs> so this is some of the images here of, of this besaton, the besaton and everybody kissing. And this is an interesting photograph because the policeman <laughs> is looking at that. <laughs> so suddenly kissing in public becomes a, a, a crime of a certain sort. <laughs> The other element is that they are really going to cluster and crystallize some strategies that are being used very much in cinema and in everywhere else, which is to, to recover the zombie and the ghost sort of imaginary, right? So in what way we are really living in a zombie sort of society? There is a book that is called Zombie Capitalism, right? So the, the situation of the students created this empathy too because there is an element here in which they say rest in peace with all these millions of, the, of, of pesos in debt, right? And, and the other element that they are going to create, this is, this is also like a thriller, like a, a performance of Michael Jackson's thriller. And here they are. The idea is that what that created in the general public who was absolutely used to see protests with big signs and the signs of communism, of anarchism, or et cetera, is that this is something different. What are they showing us? What are they telling us? So in some ways, it's going to soften and it's going to call attention in an unprecedented and orthodox orthodox manner to the general public who, as I said, don't want anything very related with, with traditional politics. And of course, this is the death of, of, of the citizens. The other element for empathy is that you see condemned by our education. They are behind bars. And the, this is absolutely incredible because this is in Santiago, you have a student's hand here, and this is the Rio Mapocho where many people was put uh, when the dictatorship killed so many people. So the mixing of the crisis of the students today being uh, basically jailed uh, um, 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 and trapped in debt and hopelessness related with the fact that the disappears were also thrown to, to the river and this, uh, this mixing of elements. So there is an, ele an element of connecting with the past. We have a past, but at the same time calling the attention to la deuda me mató, my debt killed me. And here we have this lady crossing there and paying attention to that. And of course, there is also much more like a, a festive sort of a, uh, um, a rally. This is the rally of the umbrellas in very winter uh, Santiago. And also the music and carnivals, painted naked bodies and the superheroes claiming back the education, the carnivals. 
What are the challenges of this movement? I think this movement has been absolutely successful in obtaining the 75% the of support from the, from the population. This is the 75% that is actually supporting a plebiscite to decide if, the, if education should be free or not in Chile. If that plebiscite takes place, education will be free. So there are so many campaigns taking place right now in order to allow for that to happen. What are the challenges? The, mov the movement started in May this year. So in some ways, it's suffering a certain exhaustion and it's suffering uh, from the fact that you need to keep it alive. How do you keep it alive? How do you come with new strategy so the people can maintain their support? One of the main challenges is also the fact that Chile is still a society pressed by fear. So there is a sort of a deterministic sort of element there that says, well, nothing is going to change anyway. Things are so in, in dra ingrained in our system. How we are going to change that? And I think that uh, the element of fear, as I said, um, but one of the main challenges, one of the main challenges is that these leaders are finishing their period this year. They were not going to be around next year to lead the movement. And the problem is that since the movement has absolutely shown the incapacity of the political elite to present real alternatives, we are confronted with the fact that there are no real alternatives inside to continue with the movement and to really create a cohesive political sort of uh, organization that can really put together the aspirations that the movement has put in place. So we are in a little bit of an of a end of the road, and nothing is very clear about the future. But um, I trust that they are working on it. Uh, I am a little bit prey of my own deterministic and my fear being uh, being a Chilean myself. So you have you don't have to trust me on that. <laughs> but I believe that that uh, the great the great example that the Chilean movement represents is that managed to go from being a student movement to become an absolutely social movement that has been inspiring many other uh, student movements in Latin America and around the world. Thank you.